Hey all you heroes and champions, crows, pirates, and inquisitors. Welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast. I'm Shelby. And I'm Austin. And we are so excited to bring you this podcast. Every episode, we'll be talking about a different topic in the Dragon Age universe. From the Maker to Lyrium to Aravels, we will cover it all. There will be spoilers. And always remember, swooping is bad. Hey, Shelby. Hey, Austin. How's it going? I'm pretty good. Are you ready to talk about Dragon Age today? I'm always ready to talk about Dragon Age. Awesome. Well, do you remember our topic? Uh, yeah, our topic today is about Andro- or Sorry, I keep doing that. About the maker. Ironic. Yes. I say that that's ironic because you started to say our topic is Andraste when it's really the maker. And my headcanon or hot take of the day is that the people of Thetis don't actually worship the maker. They actually worship Andraste. And that's, she's who the religion is really focused on, not the maker. Anyways. Yeah. Well, so I thought we could start with kind of just a general idea of let's who is this maker like we hear about him in the games in fact i think the start of the game mentions the chantry and we of origins mentions the chantry and we hear about this maker and but who is he like who is this guy like or person or deity that we hear so much about yeah well i don't really think we know that much about who the maker actually is is um some of the things we know about the maker are supposedly if you believe in this religion uh the maker created the world um the maker created spirits first as his children and then people humanity um there's some dialogue about whether or not the maker created the other races elves yeah probably um the rest of them i think it's going to be a hard no from the chantry um which is interesting to me um but yeah so there's that there is the to venter uh, magisters reached the golden city and turned it black and the maker cast them down um and then the maker called to Andraste. Uh, and that's 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 mostly it. Like, that's what we know about him. We don't know anything really about, like, who he is. Like, what motivates him? Why did he create um, the people of Thetis? Like, we don't, we don't know that um, information at all. So. Right, right. Um, so... I guess the point of the thing is like, what are our sources for the maker? Like in the things that we do know, where do they come from? Um, yeah, well, I think the, the biggest one is the chant of light, right? Uh, we talk about that in the game. We get codices from it. I am pulling my sources from the Dragon Age World of Thetis Volume 2 Encyclopedia, which has like a full copy of the chant of light. And it has... Um, it has like um, other verses, things that have been de- like declared heretical, other books. Um, like there's the Canticle of Chartan and um, all kinds of stuff like that. So that's really where I'm drawing most of my information from. Um, and I, I would assume that's where most of um, Thetis would get their information on the maker. In addition to what you know your everyday chantry sister or mother says about the maker right and so i guess in a sense of that let's would you say it's fair to start let's start with the chant of light and what it says absolutely absolutely yeah yeah because that's what we would do like if we were if you and i were looking at another religion one of the fourth first things that we would look at is their sacred text absolutely at the bible or the quran or some other the torah yeah the torah the i can't i don't want to butcher the pronunciation of the uh hindu text but i remember it i just don't remember how to pronounce it (laughs) sure 
<laughs> okay, yeah. So we can start with uh, the chant of light. And I do think that uh, the chant is like kind of similar to the Bible or the Torah. I'm not super familiar with the Quran, so I don't, I wouldn't want to um, compare that. But like it's named in books and it has like chapters and it has verses, which I think is really interesting. But anyway, so yeah, we can start with a chant of light and um, I'm going to read from Threnody's chapter five, which is actually um, the intro of Dragon Age Origins also begins with this part of this quotation. So I thought it was a perfect um, starting point to start our podcast and to start this episode with the same thing that the very first game starts with. So Threnody's chapter five, this is what it says. The maker creates the fade and the spirits. There was no word for heaven or for earth, for sea or sky. All that existed was silence. Then the voice of the maker rang out, the first word, and his word became all that might be. Dream and idea, hope and fear, endless possibilities. And from it he made his firstborn. And he said to them, In my image I forge you. To you I give dominion over all that exists. By your will may all things be done. Then in the center of heaven he called forth, A city with towers of gold, streets with music for cobblestones, and banners which flew without wind. There he dwelled, waiting to see the wonders his children would create. The children of the Maker gathered before his golden throne and sang hymns of praise unending. But their songs were the songs of the cobblestones. They shone with the golden light reflected from the Maker's throne. They held forth the banners that flew on their own, and the voice of the Maker shook the fade, saying, In my image I have wrought my firstborn. You have been given dominion over all that exists. By your will all things are done, yet you do nothing. The realm I have given you is formless, ever-changing. And he knew he had wrought amiss. So the Maker turned from his firstborn and took from the fade a measure of its living flesh and placed it apart from the spirits, and spoke to it, saying, Here I decree opposition in all things, for earth, sky, for winter, summer, for darkness, light. But my will alone is balance sundered, and the world given new life. And no longer was it formless, ever changing, but held fast, immutable, with words for heaven and for earth, sea and sky. At last did the maker from the living world make men, immutable as the substance of the earth, with souls made of dream and idea, hope and fear, endless possibilities. Then the maker said, To you, my second born, I grant this gift. In your heart shall burn an unquenchable flame, all-consuming and never satisfied. From the fade I crafted you, and to the fade you shall return, each night in dreams, that you may always remember me. And then the Maker sealed the gates of the golden city, and there he dwelled, waiting to see the wonders his children would create. Now with their father's eye elsewhere, the firstborn at last created something new. Envy. They looked upon the living world, and the favored sons and daughters were there, covetous of all they were. Within their hearts grew an intolerable hunger, until at last some of the firstborn said, Our father has abandoned us for these lesser things. We have power over heaven. Let us rule over earth as well and become greater gods than our father. The demons appeared to the children of earth in dreams and named themselves gods demanding fealty. And a mighty voice cried out, shaking the very foundations of heaven. Ungrateful children, I gave you power to shape heaven itself and you have made only poison. As you crave the earth, the earth shall be your domain. Into the darkness I cast you. In tombs of immutable rock shall you dwell for all time. Those who had been cast down, the demons who would be gods, 
began to whisper to men from their tombs within the earth. And the men of Tevinter heard and raised altars to the pretender gods once more, and in return were given in hushed whispers the secrets of darkest magic. Wow. Interesting, right? There's a lot to unpack there. Um, I know. There's so much, like, in that between, you know, the the creation um, of both the spirits and the people to um, the association with Tevinter as demons, like to the old gods and all of all of that storyline um just all of it is really interesting to me i think it just it shows that you you could take we really could take any one line of that entire thernity's five and probably make a whole episode of it um yeah you probably could and just so the part that just kind of stuck out to me was the use of the names of actual demons from the game uh so there's envy hunger all Mm -hmm. these all these emotions or things are specific types of demons in dragon age right Um, that's so true i didn't even notice that uh so that just that that's what kind of stuck out to me is that in a lot of ways this part of the chanted light is kind of the story of creation but it's also kind of a myth of why there is suffering and why there is evil absolutely totally yeah what sticks out to me in this is two things actually first and this is like me being a weirdo and remembering random quest names but there are so many lines of this that are names of quests in dragon age in hush in hush whispers and in your heart shall burn are the two um right off the bat that i remember there may be more i don't know um but yeah those are both from dragon age inquisition in hushed whispers is the mage quest line from inquisition correct i think so yeah and then in your heart shall burn i'm pretty sure that one is the quest where you get to skyhold yeah, I think so. I'm not, I'd have to double check that. Yeah, not verified information, but... <laughs> yeah, so there's that. Um, and then the other thing that I thought was so interesting in all of this is the opposite theme. Like, there's earth and sky and winter and summer and darkness and light. Those obviously are opposites. Like, we can say that from our world. But um, also, it it's like my will alone is balance sundered and the world given new life that's really interesting to me so like the maker isn't just this peaceful god who like wants everyone to be in harmony and um like worshiping the maker is not you're not committing to pacifism um so i I thought that was interesting in fact there would probably be members of the chantry who would argue that worshiping the maker is kind of the opposite of Mm -hmm. committing to pacifism yeah definitely Um, i the other thing that just kind of like at least like if we're talking about like who the maker is um so as you know and just to some of our listeners might know and just kind of think the idea of deism and when talking about god which is deism is that idea that god is kind of this clockmaker who made the universe and then removed God's self from the universe to watch over it. And he just watches over the, the moving pieces of the universe and doesn't intervene in it. And I used to think before kind of doing this research, I used to think, oh, that's kind of like what the maker is. The maker is just this deistic God, which in a way, like there is points to that. Like he does mm-hmm. remove himself and turns from his children, but it's more of a, it's more of a rejection of the world than a removal from the world. Yes. Yeah, totally. And I mean, the maker is, you know, he is a creator and he was involved in the world. And then the spirits, you know, kind of pissed him off. And he said, 
okay, I'm done with you. Let me do something different. And then it was kind of the same thing again. Um, so he's created that we know of, you know, two groups of beings and he's been disappointed with them both. So right. has he really created more and we just don't know about it, you know? Right. And so we get this kind of dichotomy of the maker not being removed, which I think gives credence to your earlier point that you made at the beginning of the episode of, you know, the Chantry doesn't really worship the maker. They worship Andraste. Yeah. Which kind of makes sense. Like, how do you worship a deity or a god that is rejected and turned from being involved in your life? Right. Like, why would you worship a god that hates you? Yeah. I mean, <gasps> that's a whole other topic. I know. No shade if yes. you worship a god that hates you, but I don't understand it. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, like, who... So, the first children of the Maker, if I'm understanding you correct, are the spirits. Yeah. And so, like, we know from playing the game that spirits and demons have a close relationship to one another and if you talk if you play inquisition and you talk enough to solace solace will even tell you that demons and spirits are just kind of two sides of the same coin yeah and i think you see that in the chant too um but the way that i read it the difference is a spirit becomes a demon when it's when it's infected with i don't want to just say some kind of negative emotion but um an emotion that changes them almost like the first ones become demons because of envy and then you know there's fear um and probably anger and hunger um all of those things kind of cause them to change into something that they are not but then we also meet you know spirits of compassion we meet mm -hmm. spirits in the game that are not malevolent um, right. and there's coal which is a whole other right <laughs> so there are two there are two spirit companions really if we want to talk about it throughout the three games um yeah you have coal which Cole is a whole nother episode that we'll get into just yeah we'll get his story and get your tissues out because it's sad. Um, and then there's Anders Justice, which you just kind of get, like, I almost view it as a spirit becomes a demon when it becomes a corrupted version of mm. the, ide the ideal it represents. Yeah, I, that's a great way of putting it, for So, sure. like, Justice moves to vengeance in Anders, seeing the plight of the mages. Instead of wanting justice for them it turns and is corrupted into vengeance which yeah. is different which is its own kind of just kind of another social commentary on our reality that we don't really have time to get into but mm -hmm. but yeah so you have this maker this uh who creates these first children and you said in the beginning of the episode that the maker creates a second children which the chantry teaches is mankind um, and yeah. you mentioned the other elves and that the Chantry would say, no, the Maker didn't create, you know, the Kinari or the dwarves. Right. Um, so, like, can you just go a little more into that? And um, Yeah, I, a little bit. There's not a lot of information that I have. Um, we know that the Kunari come from their, like, ancestors or a race called the Kossif. Um, and they land in Parvalin, um, which is the island there that's now their homeland. It used to be um, in control of Tevinter, but it's an island that's kind of far from the mainland. So the Kunari pretty much easily took it. Um, and they took it in um, 630 Steel Age. Um, which was, you know, quite a few ages ago. So it's basically now the Kunari homeland. Um, so they are clearly not part of the maker. We don't really know where they come from. Um, I think 
maybe DA4 might go into that a little bit more. Um, and then I'm not really sure there's anything in the chant of light that even mentions the dwarves. Right. Um, so you get, the chant of light doesn't mention the elves either, correct? At least the passage we read. Didn't the passage the we read just then does not mention the elves. That's true. However, um, there are, there are, um, canticles of Shartan and Shartan is, um, the elf that helped Andraste conquer, move into to Venter. Um, and so she freed the elves, um, or some of the elves, the ones that she could when, when they moved into, um, and started conquering lands in the Tevinter, the south of Tevinter. And so Shartan led the elves um, in her army, essentially. And so whenever, you know, their war was over, Andraste's husband, Mafrath, who betrayed her, he honored her promise to the elves and gave them the land in the Dales, um, in Orle, what is now Orle. So the elves helped Andraste and Mafrath through their whole um, excursion into Tevinter. So he has a canticle, um, and it's about rallying the armies um, for her. Um, but actually, his canticle was declared heretical. Um, I'm not sure where we find that out in the games. I can't remember. Um, but it is struck from the chant during the exalted march on the Dales. So, um, all of the, anything that has to do with the elves being involved in the chantry or the chant of light was pretty much struck from the record, um, when the exalted march to the Dales happened, um, and the elves were then expelled from their second homeland. Right. And, you know, we, we, I think we should have said this in the beginning, but just kind of reiterating, like, all of our sources about this come from the Chantry. And so like, is the Chantry this kind of reliable not narrator that we have to say like, okay, this is how it really like is in the Dragon Age world? Yeah, I would say, I think we can trust the Chantry to an extent. I, I don't think we can just take all of their sources as the unvarnished, unbiased truth. I think that we can take them and say, okay, this is what happened, but you're telling it from the angle that puts you in the best possible light. So like, yeah, okay, maybe the maker exists. We know Andrasse exists, obviously. Um, we know Shartan existed. We know Mafrath existed. Um, we know that the Tevinter Magisters, um, you know, we know that they tried to, to reach the Golden Sea. Like we know that. Those are things we know happened based on events in the game. Like, we meet Shartan in, um, in Origins when we um, are trying to get to the Ashes. Like, you, you, you can meet him. You can meet some of these other people. I think Mathrath is in there. I can't totally remember. Um, so, it's like, yes, we know some of these things happened, but also, at the same time, we're not totally sure if this is exactly how it happened. So, I tend to trust the Chantry sources, at least to an extent. Um, right. So, the Chantry might not tell us, or the games might not tell us who the maker is. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't stop the fans from speculating on who the maker is. That's very accurate. And so I have brought with us today some of my favorite fan theories on, yes. who, the, on who the maker is. Awesome. Um, my. Okay, so we're starting out. The first one is that a lot of these fan theories assume that the maker is not actually removed from the world interesting and, and that the chantry kind of has this wrong that the maker is just kind of hidden in the world in a thing like that um which kind of would make sense like we'll get into it when we talk about i'm trying not to dive too much into the elven gods because 
everyone remember this episode because it's going to feed into our conversation about the elven gods. Yeah. Um, And so the first fan theory is that Varric is the maker. Everyone's favorite deep v-neck dwarf is the maker. Um, Because he is all, in a lot of ways, starting with Dragon Age 2, he is always kind of this narrator voice, this storyteller. Um, And he has an exorbitant amount of influence over the game. And we can talk about this in the in the kind of like Varric conversation when we get to that eventually. Um, yeah. But I mean, why is it Varric is not romanceable by Hawk. So why is it that Cassandra is coming to Varric to learn information about Hawk and not, you know, if you romance Isabella or Fendris, like why aren't they trying to track them down? Why do you track down Varric? Maybe it's because Varric is easy to find, but that's there's he's always seems to be where things are happening, you know, and coming in at the right time. Like my favorite example is us. You, you and I are both playing Inquisition right now. Mm-hmm. Is like okay, Corypheus shows up and Varric just shows up and it's like, oh yeah, I do know where Hawk is. You know, like that kind of thing about like Varric is kind of that device that comes in and says like, oh well, here's this piece of information that really helps you yeah but then Varric almost dies when he does that because cassandra almost kills him so yes which if cassandra if this fan theory is true and cassandra finds out that Varric is the maker she would have a heart attack oh totally like she would go into cardiac arrest and die yes 100 percent. yes which would make me very sad (laughs) yes the player is the maker is another one which is just, you know, you affect the world in um, huge ways. I don't really take with this one because that's just how video games work. You're always this person of great influence who affects and changes the world. Because otherwise, why would you want to play the story if you're just, you know, a soldier that yeah doesn't do anything? Um, and so this kind of gets... So those are the kind of, like, individuals as the maker, like, mortals. Here is where it gets interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, the first one is that the maker doesn't exist. And this is a pretty popular one in that the maker was just a powerful elf at the time of Fen Harel and the other elven, immortal elven gods, or as, you know, we learn, spoilers for the Trespasser DLC if you haven't played it, uh, we learned that Solus tells us they were just kind of mages, really strong mages. Um, and has since died. Interesting. There is other theory that Elgernon, who is the kind of all-father leader of the Elven Pantheon, is the maker. And there's just kind of this connection. Like, the Elven go- the Elves and the Chantry are really just worshipping the same kind of thing. I totally subscribe to that fan theory. And this fan theory comes with another tidbit, which I think is really interesting, which we'll have to save when we get to our Andraste episode. But it says that Flemeth is, or that not Flemeth, but Andraste is just another incarnation of Mythal. Oh, that's super interesting. So like... Uh. Elgernon would be the maker and the all father and then Mithal is Andraste or like the all mother. Right. Which That's we can so talk about. I'll bring that fan theory back around when we talk about Andraste to kind of talk about the similarities between Mithal and Andraste which there are a lot. There's a lot of credence to this theory. Um, yeah. And I think for me, Dragon Age is kind of moving us into this direction of like, okay, there might, there's one story that each of these different groups kind of have a piece of. Yeah, and like every, every, every creation myth of all the people, like there's a part of it that's the truth and they need to be synchronized together. Not everyone has it 100% correct. Yeah. For and, sure. And so there's that, then there's, what gets this is really obscure you really have to dig in the codex to kind of get this 
uh, fan theory, but the Maker is a Titan. And for you who don't know, the Titans are kind of these uh, ancient primordial beings that existed, that the dwarves believe existed and kind of like move the earth and other. They're very connected to the ground and the earth because, you know, the dwarves at least the Orzammar dwarfs are very connected to stone and the ground and everything like that. Um, so the maker is that the Titan that lives underneath Denerim. And so Andraste had these visions because she was deeply connected to the Titan. And she was changed in the same way, again, spoilers for the Descent DLC in Inquisition, uh, she was changed in the same way that Volta was changed at the end of the descent and then okay i can totally see that one too like that has some some credence for sure so here is kind of um an interesting kind of parallel uh first of all and i will post this on our dragon age twitter uh, if you want to follow us on there volta's tarot card in inquisition is almost identical to andraste Wow, really? Yes. Um, and so, and I'll post a picture on the Twitter so those we can see that and do all of that. Uh, the other exemption is that uh, so the Golden City is described in the Chant of Light as a heart or wellspring of creation. Um, and Korth, I think is how you pronounce it. I can't be sure. Who is the Mountain Father, one of the like big old titans and dwarven kind of thing, sealed his heart in a golden cage or what is sometimes referred to as a wellspring. Uh, mm. Which could be things about like, you could say, like reading the Chant of Light, you could come to the interpretation that, okay, like creation is the heart of the maker. Like, yeah that was his heart and he seals the golden city and so in another way you could say that he sealed his heart in the golden city like yeah um another thing is lyrium is highly linked to the titans um that we learn kind of again in the descent dlc and the maker calls uh lyrium is referred to the tears of the fade uh and then this one also ties into another theory that is just a very popular fan theory. I personally don't get it because I was never obsessed with him, but Sandal is a titan and that he is the maker. Sandal. <laughs> I want him to come back. I do too. You do see you see him in the Descent DLC. No, it's Trespasser. You don't see him in Descent. You see him in, but you don't, you don't really see him in either. It's just like a note from Uh, him that you can pick up in trespasser right i'm glad they brought dagna back but i agree that uh sandal i do miss sandal a little bit um yeah so and then here's my last theory and this before we kind of move on to our second part of the show and take a break um solace is the maker and the big kind of comparison is that it's those like again this relies on Solus being a reliable narrator which I think you could argue that he is not I agree with that Um, even if he is being truthful about being Fen Harrell Fen Harrell is this trickster kind of you know god that tricks the gods and deceives them Mm -hmm. and so but the theory is is that and if we go back into the chant of light we heard the maker is responsible for creating the veil right right and solace makes the solace makes the point that he created the veil so it's either that someone's lying or Mm -hmm. solace is the maker right um and he created the veil to limit the power of the Evanaris, which are the elven gods. Yeah. And so, yeah. Those are our fan theories. Uh, I think we should... We might put a Twitter poll out to see which ones people like the best. Oh, uh, yeah. We should totally do that. Uh, yeah. And so that would be a good... 
Um, so, yeah, let's uh, take a break and we'll come back and do the second part of the show. How's that sound? Sounds great. All right. All right, welcome back. So in this next part of the show, we will be taking kind of a deep dive into maybe some familiar, some unfamiliar characters uh, that have something to do with the topic. So Shelby, why don't you give it over to you and you can tell us about who are we talking about today? Yes. So today we're talking about Divine Justinia the first. She is the first divine ever. Um, and she's also the first divine. Well, she is the first divine, but she's the divine before um, the Taventer Chantry splits from the main Chantry. That's what I'm going to call it. Um, so the earliest recorded version of the Chant of Light was written between um, minus 31 and minus 11 ancient. And it was probably written by Divine Jacinia the first. Because she lived so long ago, we don't know a ton about her life. Um, but we do know that she was thought to have been the first one to translate the chant of light. It was originally written in the original Tavine, which I find fascinating. And she translated it into Syrian, which is... Um, one of the original languages of Orle, the Syrian were a like tribe um, similar to the Alamari or the Avar, um, and they settled in Orle, and um, they're kind of like the the ancestors of of modern Orlesians. So she translated it into their language, um, and then it later got translated into the common tongue. So she was the first divine, like I said. She was appointed by Emperor Cordillus Draken, Draken in the first in one one divine. She chose her name to honor the disciple who recorded Andraste's songs. And this is my favorite part. Before her coronation, she was the only female general in the Orlesian army. And she was known as the warrior priest, which I love. Um, and her version of the Chant of Light has survived with very few changes um, to the present day. So that's a little bit about Divine Jacinia the First. And she was so popular um, as a divine that obviously now um, we're up to Divine Justinia the Fifth. So there are quite a few Divine Justinias who have, moder who have uh, modeled their time as divine upon hers. Um, one question, and you might not know this off the top of your head, but do we have like a, do we know who she was before she was Divine Justinia? Like her real name? Yeah. Um, no, we don't know her name. All right. At least not that I can find. I was just curious. Well, I think that is all the information that we have today. Um, do you have anything, any closing thoughts you want to add about the Chant of Light, Divine Justinia, or anything, Shelby? Um, I think that's it. All right, we'll see you all next week here on the Dragon Age Lorecast. Thanks for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. As always, you can find us on Twitter at DA Lorecast. If you have any lore questions, topics to unpack, or side character suggestions, email them to us at DALorecast at gmail.com. The Dragon Age Lorecast is a part of the Robots Radio Rocket Club. You can join the Robots Radio Network Discord by clicking the link in our episode description. If you enjoyed our show, we'd love it if you'd subscribe and give us a review. See you next time. Do you love Dragon Age? Have you always wanted to learn more about its vast world and detailed lore? Are you still attached to your hero of Ferelden, even a decade after Dragon Age Origins came out? Or maybe you're a newer fan, still discovering a new tidbit or quest every day. Well, either way, the Dragon Age lore cast is the podcast for you. I'm Austin, also known as Teacup. And I'm Shelby, also known as SheCup.
And come and join us as we embark on a journey to explore and discover all things Dragon Age. We'll discuss all kinds of topics, from Lyrium to the Chantry and the great mysteries of the old gods, and even more that even you Bioware superfans might not know about. So come and listen on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And always remember... Swooping.